Good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the 12th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018, and can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Um, no apologies have been received. I'm sure Mr Gibson is on his way, so we hope to have a full, full complement of members uh, shortly, and we move to agenda item one, which is uh, national outcomes. On, on March, the 29th of March, the Scottish Government laid in Parliament a document detailing the proposed revisions to the national outcomes. The committee has been designated as the lead committee through, although a number of committees have been invited to consider them and we will publish their responses. Also, the three proposed revised outcomes we will consider in more detail are, we live in communities that are inclusive, empowered, resilient and safe. We tackle poverty by sharing opportunities, wealth and power more equally. And we grow up loved, safe and respected so that we realise our full potential. So that sets the context for this morning's evidence session. And therefore, can I welcome Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution, Roger Halliday, Chief Statistician, Scottish Government, and Carol Tannehill, Chief Social Policy Advisor, the Scottish Government. You're all very welcome here this morning. Good morning. Uh, and can I invite uh, the Cabinet Secretary to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Convener, and I'll just say some words of introduction. It's now over 10 years since the National Performance Framework, MPF, was launched, setting out a vision of national wellbeing and charting progress towards this vision through a range of social, environmental and economic indicators. The framework has transformed how we operate as a government and how we align the efforts of the public sector. And we believe by aligning the whole public sector around a common set of goals, we can deliver lasting collaboration and partnership working. We wish to go further. That's why the purpose of the NPF provides a focus wider than just government and public services. And we've therefore changed the government's purpose to our purpose. The purpose is a clear statement that gives prominence to economic, environmental and social progress, focusing on reducing inequalities. The Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 means that national performance framework is now embedded in legislation and the Act requires Scottish ministers to consult on, develop and publish a set of national outcomes for Scotland and review them at least every five years. Therefore, this new parliamentary approach is most welcome and I'm open to further improvements. As part of this enhanced engagement, it, we've consulted widely with citizens and experts and asked them, what sort of Scotland do you want to live in? With children, we asked what sort of Scotland children should grow up in. And this engagement resulted in 11 national outcomes, describing what we want to achieve and the kind of Scotland we want to see. We've also reviewed the national indicators, which enable us to track progress towards the achievement of our national outcomes and ultimately the delivery of the purpose. Discussions were held with stakeholders about what they felt is important to measure, and as a result, we've included 79 indicators in the new framework. They include a number of new indicators covering important issues such as gender balance in organisations, child wellbeing and happiness, ability to influence local decisions, and work-related ill health. Whenever possible, We've selected indicators that come from established data sets and that are consistent with indicators from the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I am satisfied that we've met the requirements of the Act through an extensive consultation process and indeed gone beyond our legislative requirements in developing appropriate indicators. With our delivery partners, Carnegie UK Trust and Oxfam Scotland, we held a series of engagement events involving individuals from a cross-section of Scottish society experts, stakeholders and the Children's Parliament. This included Oxfam holding street stalls and communities across Scotland. In order to ensure wide representation from expert policymakers and practitioners, 220 organisations were invited to take part in a variety of consultation activities. And we also drew upon extensive contributions to the earlier Fairer Scotland and Healthier Scotland consultations and together they comprise substantial public engagement involving more than 16,000 participants at public events and reaching more than 400,000 people online. There has been cross-party engagement in the development of the new NPF with a roundtable group which I chair that includes representatives from each party in Parliament and leaders from the public, private and third sectors and have also had strong positive engagement from local government. Monitoring of the national indicators and assessment of progress towards achieving the outcomes will continue to be available through our Scotland Performs website. 
And finally, I'm grateful to this committee for taking the lead in this scrutiny process. The committee will be aware that I led oversight of the MPF renewal process and individual cabinet secretaries have overseen the outcomes and indicators that relate to their portfolios. I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have arising from the consultation process or other aspects of the NPF refresh. Uh, that's very helpful, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm sure some of the members in the course of the evidence session this morning will want to talk about uh, the nature of the consultation how meaningful that was, the length of time open for parliamentary scrutiny. And we'll come we'll come to that, but I thought it might just be reasonable to start about how how certain decisions are made. So um there, there's an existing national outcome which is we have strong, resilient, supportive communities where people take responsibility for their own actions and how they affect others and we live our lives safe from crime to, uh, crime disorder uh, and, and 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 danger. Uh, so that becomes a new a new outcome, a proposed draft outcome of we live in communities that are inclusive, empowered, resilient and safe. Now, all three of those statements I read out are very good and desirable things, but how do you move from the, the first two statements I read to the third statement? So can you take me through that process and what the thinking is behind that? How do we get to that stage? Okay, I, I'll certainly ask policy officials to come in. It's important to, to recognise in this process that as politicians we started off with what kind of society that we want to live in. Therefore we're defining our purpose and you will see some transformation of purpose and then it works through the outcomes and then the indicators. And clearly they all relate uh, to each other and arriving at the outcomes and the um, progress of the outcomes um, We've tried to ensure that there's clarity, it's simple language, it reflects our, our vision as not just government, but as a country as well, respecting our values and trying to distill that into clear, you know, purposeful, meaningful outcomes that then can be measured where that's appropriate and then can be um, uh, delivered. Each individual portfolio, but recognising that the outcomes work right across portfolios, but each individual portfolio was led by a cabinet secretary in, in terms of making sure that they were comfortable with what our outcomes were and what could be reasonably uh, measured. I'm sure we'll get into more of the detail uh, in that regard. Uh, but the reason I want to turn to the officials on this is to stress the point that of course is this is politically led because this is about our democracy, this is about our parliament, as well as our government shaping what we believe our mission and our outcome is. But within that, the consultation exercise that we undertook with society, with experts, with stakeholders, has largely been, in terms of the technical issues, led by officials. And that was important to make sure it had that degree of credibility and partnership working, not just with civil service, but well beyond, and why we specifically commissioned uh, the charities that I've named to take forward very focused pieces of work in arriving at the individual outcomes that we've now come to. Um, so so if, if you want further information on, on that particular point about those two outcomes relating to the third, I can ask Roger or Carol to come in on that. Just, just before we get that answer, I, I, I'm sensing from, from that detailed reply, Cabinet Secretary, the, 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 at the heart of it is it was a shorter, more focused, easier, more easy to understand outcome. I think that's what was wrapped up within that answer. I'm just checking. Is that effectively what, what's been said? Maybe your officials might want to. Yes, say but more the about reason that. I'm making that point is that applies to every single outcome and the overall purpose. Because if you look at the detail, overall can be none. It is important to make this point at the outset because the same could be asked of any set of indicators. And 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 I appreciate the interest in this committee particularly. But of all the outcomes, we felt it was important not just to count how many outcomes we had, but they were meaningful and they were easy to understand and are actually you know, as deliverable as possible. That's why overall we've got fewer uh, outcomes than before, but actually more indicators. Um, so that's the sense of why we've arrived at the outcomes that we have, and if you want further information on that. that I'll ask about indicators shortly, but yeah, that would okay. be helpful if one of your officials wanted to add to that. Don't, actually, I don't have an awful lot to, to, to add to that. I mean, the, the starting point was that uh, the feedback from um, consultees was that we need to make the language and the whole look of the framework simpler and, and uh, the, that we heard from people that the words inclusive, empowered, resilient and safe are really important when it comes to, to thinking about communities uh, and that's exactly uh, what we've, we've done 
um, in this case trying to make uh, the, the overall framework simpler and capture the, the spirit of uh, the, the words that we heard from people. Okay, um, maybe come on to look at the, the, the national indicators that are kind of wrapped up within that, that uh, draft outcome, just, just to remind people that we live in communities that are inclusive and power resilient and safe, that particular one. So there's a number of indicators, that I, I wouldn't read them all, but one of them is, is loneliness uh, and one of them is um, perceptions of, of local crime rate. So perceptions of local crime rate, I'm, I'm a bit more cited in how that could be measured because there, there's, I think there's an annual crime survey and we, 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 we do the contrast between people's perceptions of crime and, and crime levels and that stuff's there. But uh, loneliness, where do we start on that, Cabinet Secretary? Um, I'm happy to turn to Carol or Roger on, on the details of how you measure it. Can I just make one point around um, measurements specifically, though? It, it is important for us to set out through the National Performance Framework to set out what's important to us as a society, recognising that we won't necessarily be able to measure everything. And if you take that in that regard, there's specific groups where there's been... Uh, targeted strategies such as isolation or loneliness amongst older people, for example. Um, but some elements of this will be easier to measure than others. But that said, it's important to state, uh, is it not what's important to us as a society? But Reg Roger can cover how you measure that. Yeah, he is, of course, the chief statistician, so it'll be his responsibility <laughs> well, to report on these it, measurements. Indeed so. And uh, <laughs> so... Um, with with loneliness um, and with uh, social capital and the other ones um, places to interact, there's a new set of modules around social capital that are going into our Scottish household survey and have started to be collected this year. So we won't be able to report uh, directly in June on progress, but when the, the 2018 um, Scottish household survey results come out, um, we will be able to do that do so. And in fact, sort of measuring people's experiences and their views on, on things, you know, they're relatively well-established uh, approaches to, um, to, to measurement. Uh, the, so, for example, the, the indicator on the quality of, of public services has been uh, in place in the Scottish Household Service since 1999. Uh, and so I, and we are essentially, we're using a lot of our, um, our household surveys to measure a number of the things that, that have come in. Um, and... I would say that all the existing indicators that we have within the framework are um, quality assured uh, and they're uh, independently scrutinised by the UK Statistics Authority and quite marked with the, um, the badge of national statistics, uh, the sort of quality kite mark for official statistics. And therefore, I'll be confident that uh, these will be particularly helpful measures. Actually, for that particular indicator, it'll be captured within the, the, the household survey. That's exactly um, right. There is, of course, a consultation ongoing just now in relation to a loneliness strategy. I think Jude, Jude Freeman's leading on, on, on that. So um, should we... Uh, uh, will that interact with each other? Will that question change? Yes. Um, no. so, so the, the, the proposal for the loneliness and social isolation strategy includes a commitment to... Um, regularly gathering data on loneliness and social isolation. So this will be the same. It will exactly match what that strategy is seeking to achieve. Can I, can I just pick on another out outcome and a related indicator? Because I want to kind of make, make a wider point. Uh, so let, let's go for... Let's not go for the, the outcome where we tackle poverty by sharing opportunities, wealth and power more equally, because a lot of the indicators there, you could perhaps see quite clearly how that could be identified uh, at, at a national level. But the, the one, the other one we're, we're interested in is we grow up loved, saved and respected so that we can realise our full potential. So one of those indicators that's easy to measure is healthy weight. Uh, but one that might be more difficult to measure would be children having po uh, uh, positive relationships. Um, now I, I'm usually really keen to see clear national criteria and indicators covering the whole of Scotland and it's all reliable but I look at this and I think I wonder if some of these might be best collected at a local level by local authorities and perhaps some of the measurement matrices local authorities know maybe their area is better and they might have their own framework for collecting some really important data around that so I suppose that's the reason for contrasting the, I feel like the easy hard targets 
because you can collect you, you can collect the numbers but when it's the kind of softer things, sometimes the much more important things in a community, that's much harder to collect other than a, a, a survey. So what role is there for COSLA in this? What role is there for local authorities? And what role is there maybe for a little bit of flexibility at a local level for how they can collect some of that data and measure it qualitatively rather than just quantitatively? Uh, I think it's a good question. There are a number of strands to it. First of all, I think I tried to indicate just a moment earlier that there are many things that are important to us as a society but might be quite difficult to measure and don't underestimate things like kindness and love and all of that it might be hard to to measure but it's been important in this consultation and it's important that it's expressed uh, in that fashion I'm, I'm, I'm very mindful when there was engagement with um uh looked after children uh, that when asked about their needs, their number one ask was was love. You know, it's how, how do you measure it? But it was important. If you want to respond to people, listen to what they're saying, and, and this NPF refresh has done that. So I, I think that's the first important point, that it is in expressing what's important to us as a society can't always be measured, but we should still be able to express it. And if we can measure it, try, try and do so. There are indicators um, in that uh, uh, that regard uh, as you, you've mentioned which then led to your question around local government I think it's very welcome that local governments um, responded very strongly to the MPF through their governance structures they've had uh, early sight of it um, I think it's been to leaders meeting it's certainly been to the presidential and the cross-party team who I had a meeting with they were actually of the view that the partnership working here was so strong uh, that it, it, it kind of helps create a new framework for further partnership working. So it's a very strong response from local government. And essentially, in endorsing it in the fashion that they have, it suggests that you know, they agree with where we are on purpose and values and uh, uh, the outcomes as well. As to local variance, as was the case before on the single outcome agreements, I, unless this committee says otherwise, I, I think it'd be very hard to disagree with the proposition we're putting forward, but I'm not prejudicing your view as a committee considering the amount of cross-party work that's gone on. So local government, I think, should use this as a very good foundation, as should other parts of the public sector, of course. But of course they may want to add to it, and of course they will attach appropriate weighting to what's more appropriate in their uh, area. What happened in single outcome agreements in the last iteration is that local authorities could choose from a, a menu of indicators what was most important for their area. We all agreed on the outcomes and the purpose, but they could determine what was more important to them. And in community plan partnerships, they could then bow on or enhance data or particular a purpose around exercise. So they are perfectly at liberty to do all of that uh, again. And, and your point is an important one around there may be more local intelligence or knowledge than we necessarily have as at the national picture. And again, all the community plan partnerships, uh, of which local authorities are key, key partners, um, uh, can, can absolutely do that in the fashion uh, that you have um, uh, uh, described, recognising there are some areas they might want to go further or have more data. The other point about how we report this is an improvement in monitoring and reporting that on our website, because the best way now to report this, of course we can produce paper um, reports, we'll do that, we'll continue to do it through the scorecard to committees through the budget process. But actually online is really powerful because you can get the most up-to-date um, dashboard of performance on that uh, and also the relationship between the indicators. Um, and the reason I, I, um, I identify that is we're going to try and make it as local as we can as well uh, and make it uh, clearer around equality groups also. So it shows not just the overall progress we're making on these outcomes, but how it affects particular groups and where we can, how it affects particular areas, which will help drive that discussion around how local authorities and other key um, local partners can respond to this national framework. I think finally, before, uh, before other committee members come in, uh, Will there be a set reporting framework for local authorities or will there be specific single outcome agreements by which local authorities uh, uh, play their part in achieving these outcomes? Essentially, what was called the single outcome agreements before becomes the local improvement plans going forward. That's the language that's used in the Act. Uh, but, but essentially, there is that reporting 
that was undertaken with single outcome agreements and the local community plan partnership outcomes and indicators and monitoring. So yes, that continues, albeit by a different name. Local improvement plans, uh, are they signed off by yourself and the leader of each local authority? Or are they, are, 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 is it the local authorities decide themselves or is it a co-produced document? I think, Convener, you need to be careful with the language here, recognising the full extent of all stakeholders involved in community plan partnerships. Uh, local authorities may well be the lead in some CPPs. All are absolutely fundamental stakeholders. Other CPPs might be led by, by someone who's maybe not a, a local authority figure. But your, your point is right that it's a partnership approach between all community plan partners and all agencies that should be involved and government signing that off in partnership, and that continues. Right, that, that's helpful. And I, I take on board the point you're making about community planning partnerships, and it's not just local authorities within communities. That, that's helpful. Uh, Monica Lennon. Oh, thank you, um, convener. If we can just stick with local government uh, then, so some positive information from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, we did get a number of responses uh, during recess, so um, people had a, a week to, to give views, and we did get some, so we're, we're grateful for them. Some of the views from councils are, are quite mixed. So I just wondered, um, Cabinet Secretary, what is your response to some of the concerns that, that have been raised by local government partners? Um, well, you've probably seen more of the evidence that's been submitted to the committee um, than I have, so I'm not sure what criticism there's been, but I can, I can happily engage. But sure. in terms of the leadership, of a COSLA, which is the presidential team and all the political parties represented at COSLA have engaged very positively with me. And that was, you know, endorsement's a strong word, but they felt this was such a positive um, piece of work and um, ultimately conclusion at that point that they felt that that was a very sound basis for further partnership working. Um, of course, they stressed the point, as I made earlier, about attaching appropriate weight to local circumstances, uh, flexibility locally where well, that's important, but, but the leadership was certainly signed up to this. And as I understand it, it's gone to the leaders' meeting, and Monica Lennon, uh, having come from local government, as I have done, knowing that the leaders' meeting is the 32 council uh, leaders, and if they have an objection, they'll say so. But the engagement I've had with uh, local government collectively has been uh, positive, partly because I've engaged with them from the start and they're also represented on uh, on the round table. Um, so if there is speci I'm happy to take any specific concern that may have been raised, but that's been my interaction with yeah, local no, government. Overall, I, I do find that quite reassuring. I think, for example, Falkirk Council, and, and the councils who did respond, they're all of different political makeups, but Falkirk were a little bit gloomy, um, and just in terms of evaluation, actual be able to evidence outcomes. They said that more thought needs to be given to the inter interdependencies between the, the outcomes. Is, is that something that you recognise from these conversations? Oh, ab ab absolutely. And and that's why in the... I mean, I th that's a fair point. And that's why I've tried to express that. I mean, I've got lead role for this within government. Well, ultimately, the First Minister has. Um, a, but the Cabinet's collective responsibility... Um, cabinet secretaries have led in their individual portfolios. But we've had to recognise that right across Cabinet there's the interrelationship and interdependencies, as Monica Lennon described it, of all the outcomes, of all the indicators, to the purpose. And, that, and that's why even producing a monitoring report, some of the indicators relate to different outcomes. And um, trying to structure that in paper form was difficult, and that's why I say even how you describe that is better done online. How you then work together... And that's the key point, isn't it? How the whole public services, and the important point about our purpose is wider than just public services, how all of society works together to help achieve that, of course, requires a range of, of actions. But having such a clear plan and clear outcomes allows that collaborative working where at least we're all working towards the same purpose and goals. And in terms of the difficulty in measuring and evaluating certain aspects. I go back to what I said earlier. We know that some of it's difficult to measure, but just because it's difficult to measure doesn't mean we don't want to achieve it. OK, no, that, that's helpful. Um, uh, the point you made, especially in, in response to, to the convener about um, other partners beyond just local government, I noted that Audit Scotland had some concerns that... Um, perhaps not all public bodies are embedding these national outcomes when they are reporting. So, for example, 
Scottish Enterprise um, in their latest annual report, there doesn't appear to be any explicit reference um, to the National um, Performance Framework. Um, again, is that something that, that you're mindful of? Is, uh, do public bodies have to do better to make sure they are embedding the NPF into to all of their, their work? I, I think there's a point in that, that every part of, of the public sector, and especially those um, responsible to ministers, of course, are, are charged with a uh, their, their mission, uh, their objectives, and it depends on the nature of the public sector, a public service uh, organisation. But I think what we should do, I think taking that point uh, on board, what we will do when we have the agreement and we publish the outcomes and it has Cabinet sign-off as we launch it, I think it is important that we stress the importance of it to all parts of the public sector and, and in fact, beyond you know, public, private, third sector. Um, so emphasise the point that there should be a clear linkage between the mission and objectives of all parts um, of, of public service uh, to this. So because we're refreshing it, renewing it, aligning it with a range of government strategies, there is a, a wonderful opportunity to show the importance of it and express that. I'll do that by a high-profile event launching this, uh, as well as... Um, writing to all chief executives to express its importance. Now, if we then have to look further at how we're evaluating and monitoring the performance of public agencies to ensure that it's being embedded in, then I'll certainly give that further thought. Uh, I have been satisfied up until this point, including up to this point, that we have actually um, got the buy-in of the public sector. But we have a, an opportunity to help reset that and make sure it is embedded in a way that um, pre-legislation, pre-community uh, empowerment legislation 20, 2015, the Act, um, it wasn't embedded in legislation. It was, you know, the government's mission, but it wasn't embedded in legislation. Now that it has that statutory footing, I, I think it gives us an even stronger basis in which to charge our public um, sector agencies with that, with that duty. No, again, that's that's encouraging. Clearly, there's an opportunity here. But in terms of, you know, leadership teams across the public sector, um, nothing here should be coming as a surprise. So it should be already embedded. So I feel slightly uneasy that it's going to take this kind of high level event for people to maybe get that message. But I don't know if your official wanted to, to I, come in. So what I'm saying is, I believe it is embedded. But what I'm saying is a wonderful opportunity because of the renewal, the refresh, the extent of buy-in that I believe that there is, to, to take that moment to make sure that we're all aligned to it, especially because there's a shift positively in purpose, you know, being more inclusive in our purpose, focus on well-being in our purpose as well. So I'm just saying I, I am satisfied that there has been buy-in, but I just sense a great opportunity for us to do even better in that regard. But I think Carol maybe wants to add Yes. Something. So I think to reassure committee, we're really aware of the challenge here of getting this embedded in the way that everybody does their business in Scotland. And um, I think we have got a real opportunity. We've already trailed it through the Scottish Leaders Forum, which is the forum where the senior leaders across uh, public sector get together. So we've already talked with them about it and we'll continue to keep it a live issue in that forum. Um, and as well as the, the sort of very senior leadership that the Cabinet Secretary is referencing here, we will, we have a communications plan that will involve us throughout the coming year making sure that we are present and engaging with all sorts of different forums that take place throughout the year to keep this very high on different organisations' agendas. And also to talk to them about what it means for them, because it's going to mean different things for different parts of the system, obviously, and people um, often want to engage with us on how actually they can operationalise uh, these outcomes in their own setting. So um, it's both about raising awareness and about that sort of engagement, and we do have a plan to do that over the coming year. OK. I mean, I'm sure our colleagues on the, the Audit Committee will explore further um, the information that Audit Scotland have put forward um, because they have expressed concerns that their outcomes um, don't measure the contribution of policies and initiatives to delivering those outcomes. So I think Audit uh, Committee will pick that up. But I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his comments so far. I wanted to pick up on a couple of submissions that did come in during recess. Um, Child Poverty Action Group, for example, um, they've said to us that, that tackling poverty isn't 
an outcome that is a process uh, to uh, achieve the goal of eradicating poverty for good. So they have said in their submission to the committee that the outcome should be changed to we end poverty by sharing opportunities, wealth and power more equally. Um, is that a fair comment from CPAG, Cabinet Secretary? I, I'm not uh, disputing their comment or their view, but on that national outcome, we have we tackle poverty by sharing opportunities, wealth and power more equally. That's, that's the words we've um, arrived at in terms of that particular outcome. In relation to this, um, we can use all forms of different words to ultimately mean the same thing, but words are important. They're very important. I, in this, and I have tried to get as much consensus as possible. So I'd say back to the committee, if, and it's very hard to micromanage elements of this, considering the consultation that's gone through, the round table, cabinet process, but if there is a strong view, um, the parliamentary process is such that a committee can take a view. Um, I understand this committee will lead the debate in the chamber. Um, the government will consider this parliamentary process and, and finally publish our um, you know, our, our final position uh, and publish those outcomes. So I don't see a strong case to change the wording that I've got, but your question is, uh, am I open-minded to it? Yes, but I, I'm open-minded to considering a change of wording if there's a good case so to do. But I'm fairly, I am satisfied with what we've got at the moment. The other thing is as well, as I said earlier, that each cabinet secretary as appropriate, for example, the community secretary would have had a lead role in the uh, outcome and the indicators uh, in in her brief. Um, so I will obviously have to engage if there are suggestions to the wording that we've got. But I would want a strong case to why we should change the wording when arguably what you've said and what I've said arrives at the same outcome. We're trying to tackle poverty. But yeah. I get the point around process and outcome. Yeah, no, I appreciate, Cabinet Secretary, you maybe haven't seen all the responses that have been sent to us, but a couple of stakeholders have highlighted instances where the means appear to be confused with the ends. So the Carnegie Trust UK pointed out that the single purpose includes both the ends and the means. So um, I think if you look at CPAG, SCVO, Carnegie Trust, there's, there's a sort of pattern there. Um, I don't know if they've highlighted that in the earlier sessions, but yeah, I think it's something that's it's worth looking at. The, let's not underestimate, though, the uh, consensus and breadth of support for you know the purpose, for the outcomes, for the indicators. Uh, the engagement that we've, we've gone through and I think there's far more around the kind of the, the, the inclusive and the well-being and the sustainability agenda because government policies moved on society and our understanding of what what people aspire the country to be has moved on because of the nature of engagement so um, there will although we've tried to make it feel as outcomes focused as possible and trying to define the outcomes there will sometimes be a bit of process creeps in it's the nature of the beast when we're using words and narrative. But I don't think there's any suggestion that it's not seen as a priority tackling poverty because of the way that we've described it. Just one final question on one of the, the indicators uh, which will we'll go, and that is access to suitable housing. Um, obviously, this committee's had a big interest in housing. Um, so the indicator... Um, was a percentage of homeless households that are entitled to settled accommodation. That will be replaced with satisfaction with housing, um, percentage of people satisfied with their, their home. Um, I see from the explanatory notes that because of the new indicator, it's felt that the previous indicator is no longer relevant, but they are both kind of measuring different things. Can I just dig into that a little bit? I mean, access is suitable housing, um, that covers up a lot of ground in terms of people's physical needs, size of their family and, and so on, and being in a, a place that's, that's safe. Why would that indicator be dropped, Cabinet Secretary? But can I ask Roger to come in with, with the specifics? But before he does that, convener, if I may, in a number of these areas, again, we've tried to make it about outcomes and what can be measured and everything I've, I've pointed out earlier. There'll be some elements of measurements, and, and this is a good example to make, there'll be some measurement that we are not measuring for the purpose of the National Performance Framework because it might not be as appropriate, but it will still be measured and it will still be reported and it will still be part of 
you know, of other accountability exercises. But for an outcomes-based mission, some are more appropriate to have in here uh, than others. And there's other examples of that as well around what you measure, for example, in the health service. There are some things we were measuring that were about system performance rather than outcomes. So it will still be measures, it will still be reported, the government will still be accountable for it through the health boards. All of that still continues, but some measurements were not appropriate in an outcomes-based exercise focusing on essentially are our people getting healthier and um, are we tackling the inequalities, all of that. Um, so I just make that point generally about there are many things we continue to measure. It's just not appropriate to have them here. As to the specific example um, around housing, I'll ask Roger to... Okay, so um, so we did quite wide consultation uh, with people about the indicators that we'd bring into the framework, and in fact we had million well we didn't have millions of ideas we had hundreds of ideas and I had to have a way of kind of narrowing that down and focusing that down, and the sort of principles that I used for doing that is ones that enable us to measure progress against each outcome that they can describe uh, importantly progress not just for Scotland but for different uh, equality groups and for area based inequalities. Uh, and in that they're consistent with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and where there's new data that's required that that's uh, feasible and affordable. Um, but with this one in particular, the, the fifth and final criteria that I had is that the, the data on which this needs to be based needs to be technically a good indicator. So if the number goes up, that, that means an improvement or a worsening. And if, if the number goes down, that means the opposite. Where, with this uh, particular measure around housing, this was already at 96%. The 96% of people said that they were getting a suitable uh, access to suitable housing options. And that really then doesn't give, uh, you know, uh, much of a, that there's not really much scope for that to move around. That hasn't been, you know, sort of moving around all that much. Uh, whereas the, the measure on satisfaction with housing uh, should give a much better indication of, uh, people's uh, the, a similar kind of concept, but is a, a much stronger indicator that will tell us whether things are improving or worsening. Okay, and you don't think there's there's room to have both indicators? Uh, well, I I need to be quite clear uh, that uh, you know be relatively ruthless with the number of indicators that we've got. Um, well, most other countries, uh, when we've they've got a a similar kind of framework to this, have uh, less than 50 indicators. I was speaking to people earlier on this week from New Zealand and England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and each of which has, has got under 50. And and that is because if you get too many, then it becomes difficult to really see what's going on uh, here. So I think the 79's on the sort of upper bounds of that. Uh, but I, I was conscious, I did want to have uh, indicators on similar things within this framework that uh, what we needed to have is pick the strongest indicator for a particular concept and go with that. Supplementary then, because I understand the need to manage the, the number of indicators. The Sidonians in their submission, they've noted that 11 of the outcomes are less age and family specific and are much more universally applicable. And I think their concern is that um, there'll be less emphasis on the experience of the most vulnerable groups. Is that something that was a risk factor in all of this? I think that the way that we did this mm -hmm. was exactly to mitigate that risk. So at the moment, um, when we report publicly on it, uh, on progress, we're reporting on progress for Scotland overall. And what we're going to be doing moving forward is uh, rep reporting on not only Scotland uh, progress overall, but progress for each of the equality groups uh, within Scotland, uh, progress on... Uh, area-based inequality using the index of multiple deprivation and there, there, there are potentially a few indicators where we may be reporting on progress at, uh, at local levels as well uh, when they're about the distribution of, of things across uh, Scotland. So I think absolutely uh, you'd be able to uh, see progress in, uh, in a much broader uh, context which should absolutely mitigate against their concerns. Convener, can I give reassurance around that point as well because actually it's a very substantial point that the whole mission here um, is about a whole population approach so 
against most of these outcomes, actually tackling inequalities is in every single one of them. And that's why in how we can disaggregate the data, hopefully we will be able to drill into that and say, OK, how are we achieving on gender inequality and that age equality and that... So my point is it's whole population. In the past, sometimes we've had maybe an outcome that this is what we're doing for older people in that category, and this is what we're doing on maybe gen gender. What this is saying is that is equality is embedded right through it, and where we can, we'll measure it on the, those basis right across uh, the outcomes rather than trying to separate it out. So let's make that very important point, but that's how we achieve equality, by not separating out and having specific targets for specific groups and saying, no, no, we aspire to the, um, uh, the, the equality right across the range uh, of outcomes, with the exception of to draw attention to um, children only because the range of interventions are such uh, that that's why it requires a separate element for growing up. For every other part of society, it's clear that it's a whole population approach. Can I go back to your earlier point? Um, because I want to be helpful around this. It, it relates to my point around if there are things we are measuring right now, just because it's such a high satisfaction level, I'm sure committee would want to be reassured if it went the other way. You would want to know about it. So if there are individual indicators that you want us to look at, to be reassured, OK, where is that reported? elsewhere, because there, as I say, there are many things that we'll no longer measure as part of the national performance framework, but we're still measuring and reported elsewhere, mm -hmm. we can tick up, uh, pick up those individual points to give you reassurance that for the purpose of this, this is what we're doing. But if you want reassurance on any further indicator, maybe even those that we're proposing no longer to continue with, or there's a comprehensive report on why that is the case that has been submitted in terms of the consultation, then I'm happy to look at that to say, OK, it's maybe not appropriate for the MPF, but as Parliament, you know, content that we're still reporting on things that are important to Parliament. And again, I'm very open to that. Thank you. That's very helpful. Really, really interesting line of question. Just before we move on, the satisfaction with housing indicator I thought was a particularly interesting one. I think our Deputy Convener is really spot on in, in how to, to kind of analyse some of this. But when I was reading satisfaction with housing and suitable housing, my constituents would say to me, I might be suitably housed because I need three, I need three bedrooms, but I'm um, second floor in a tenement flat, but I'm not satisfactory housed because I want a back and front door for my wings to play about in. So actually, I think that I'm interested to know how you will define to be satisfactorily housed, because I've got a lot of constituents who are suitably housed in terms of housing legislation, but they're certainly not satisfactorily housed. And I would want to, I would actually hope, ironically, that 96% rating falls, because it will capture some of that very, very reasonable housing aspiration, which should just be a reality for more people. So I'd be interested to know your comments on that, and how that would actually link to other indicators, such as children's material deprivation, because there's a link there, if you don't have a garden or green space for your kid to play in, or on another draft outcome, access to green and blue space, for example. So an opportunity to say what you mean by satisfaction with housing and an opportunity to see how you might tie some of those indicators together to get a much more nuanced, individualised view of what it actually means to the families that we all represent. Uh, Camille, I, again, I'll ask Roger to talk about um, the specifics uh, of, of that indicator. Um, your point about a range of indicators are informative because the same person may say that they're satisfied with housing, but there might be other indicators that suggest you know, there's work to be done as a society and there's other elements to their overall environment that has to be improved. So that's not seen as the catch-all of satisfaction in every aspect of someone's life. Um, Roger can speak to the detail of, of the indicator. But the important point here is that the indicators, that I think, of, as we've been discussing this morning, are absolute, absolutely interdependent and relate to each other. Um, one thing that we must also be fair about, that um, we must analyse data as well, um, but it has to be credible data, and that's why extra effort has been given by officials to ensure that the data is, is credible. There are some administrations in some parts of the world that don't like the views of experts and don't listen to the evidence that's put before them, but we've tried to have an evidence-based approach on this. 
Not James, can you? They're hardy. Believe it or not, just because of time constraints, other members do want in and myself and the Deputy Commissioner have taken quite a lot of that air time. Could you drop us a note after the meeting with some more information in relation to that and not allow others to get in with their lines of questioning? But I just thought it was important to follow up the Deputy Convener's point to bring to life what the indicator actually would mean in reality. So that would be very helpful. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I just want to take you back a wee bit uh, to your opening statement and you, you spoke about children and incorporating their views into this process and asking them what kind of Scotland they wanted to grow up in. And obviously 2018 is a year of young people. So I'm really interested to hear how that engagement was carried out. I don't know if you can speak to that in a bit more detail. Um, I know uh, that 102 children were spoken to by the Children's Parliament. Can you perhaps tell us a wee bit more about that process? Yeah, I, I can do some of that. And um, further, further to that, uh, hopefully the committee has the consultation reports that yeah. Oxfam and Carnegie Trust undertook for us specifically. Um, people can be approached randomly, of course, in all consultations. People can be self-selecting as well, but that's why we went out to particular groups to be able to uh, hear the views of those young people, and the Children's Parliament was one place to do that. What's been slightly different about this level of engagement is... Um, Public organisations are sometimes accused of generating consultation fatigue by constantly going out to consult on an idea or a proposition or a policy or whatever it happens to be. What we try to do here, as well as the bespoke consultation exercise that engaged in young people, was also to learn from um, all the other consultations, quite comprehensive consultations that the government had undertaken, uh, principally around a healthier Scotland and a fairer Scotland. So young people would have been part of that, but we specifically um, approached young people through the um, commissions that we gave to the charities involved uh, to be able to listen to young people so it could help shape this and help shape um, the mission as well so that we're fully informed as to what young people actually want in designing the mission um, of um, of government, public services and, and wider than that. Roger, can you say a bit more? And if you require further detail, if it's not within the consultation reports we've given you, we can supplement that if required. Yeah, and so the, the events, the, the Children's Parliament ran a, a series of events with, uh, with children aged um, 7 to 12, and that, that was really to sort of help understand what was going to be important to them, both in their lives at the moment and in, in the future w within the country. And I, I suppose that we, th th yeah, that was just sort of one element that fed into the, that wider, uh, wider conversation, but, um, you know, was particularly important clearly for, um, for not just the, the outcome on children, but, um, but the broader um, set of, of outcomes that we, that we had. Uh, and I think, like, like the cabinet secretary said, uh, that there's a quite a detailed report from the children's parliament uh, that we we published as part of the um, the documentation. So I, th I think that that's a pretty good place to go because that's uh, there's a lot of detail in there. A point of wider stakeholder in, uh, engagement. One of the issues that we're currently facing as a committee with regard to the planning bill, um, in terms of local place plans, is that. Um, perhaps communities that don't have well-established community councils uh, are disadvantaged because they don't have community capacity to engage in the process. How did you reach out to, you know, not the, the kind of usual suspects, as it were? Um, because I note that I think 161 out of the 220 organisations that you asked to engage in the process did so. So was it the usual suspects you were engaging with? How did you tackle that, that kind of challenge in terms of particularly, I'm thinking about poorer communities, because the overarching aspiration that you spoke about, Cabinet Secretary, at the start was uh, reducing inequalities. So how do you get the voices of those communities that are disadvantaged in involved in that process? First of all, you have to go to areas of multiple deprivation. You don't just wait in a hall for someone to approach you and hope that they fully represent the full nature of society. So you have to go to people individually. Um, that's also included looked after children. Cabinet has been um, requested to be and has actively been involved in listening to people in coming to these propositions. Uh, just recently, the First Minister had a Young People's Cabinet, um, where a, in a full session of Cabinet, then young people of, of mixed ages, um, mixed backgrounds, if I can say, then represent what's important to them. And of course, I was listening, doing my finance secretary job, but also thinking about, and what does this mean for the national performance framework, as every other cabinet secretary would be. That was children's parliament, that was youth parliament, and that was um, 
uh, some of the young people in attendance had, had care experience. So that just shows that we didn't just wait for people to approach us with what was important to them. We went out specifically to ensure that uh, more vulnerable groups and sections of society were listened to and heard as well, as well as a random of approach of, of public engagement about who, who we approach. Um, but there was a specific request to go to areas of multiple deprivation and that was done. Carol, can you add anything? Well, I was just going to say that, that that was part of the commission, uh, was to make sure that um, people were engaged from a range of different backgrounds and communities. And just to add also to what the Cabinet Secretary said, the, the Fairer Scotland and Healthier Scotland conversations also absolutely had that at their heart. So, I mean, the Fairer Scotland work engaged with thousands of people from different backgrounds and in different parts of the country. So, I mean, it, it, it is extremely challenging to do this absolutely comprehensively but but my view is that that this process has had a very wide reach um, and have, and has reached a real good mix of people and it's not only the sort of formal consultation bit that has informed what's here it's everybody's day-to-day -day interactions and awareness of what people are saying so um, from my point of view it, it, it's been a, a good wide-ranging process thank you okay uh, Andy White Convener, thanks, Cabinet Secretary, for coming along today. Um, I just want to ask a couple of lines of questions, one on um, the purpose and one on the sustainable development goals. In the, um, the new purpose, um, you talk about um, a successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increased well-being and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. As you'd be well aware, sustainable and inclusive economic growth is a contested term. Um, and I'm just wondering, because in the proposed outcome on the economy, you talk about a globally competitive, entrepreneurial, inclusive and sustainable economy. Um, can I suggest that it might be better just to have a sustainable economy in the purpose, rather than what is quite a mechanistic and contested metric, in fact, about growth? I understand uh, the point that Mr Whiteman's saying. I am content with purpose because I believe that shows the, the continuity of, of the government's purpose. And I also understand some of the um, environmental views around um, why include growth. But I have to say that the government's view of growth is absolutely um, conditioned by our views around inclusive growth, uh, sustainable growth, and it's taken into account those environmental concerns in that purpose. And of course, when it comes to um, uh, sustainability, it runs right through the outcomes and the indicators, indeed adopting uh, the, UN, uh, the UN's uh, sustainable uh, development goals is, is absolutely embedded in this. I, I think we're the first government that's embedded it in this fashion, uh, in fact. But I'm content that our purpose is refreshed, renewed, revitalised, uh, improved, not just because I've done it, uh, but because, convener, <laughs> um, we have we've listened to people to try and make sure that the purpose captures what what we want to achieve, and I think those improvements um, make sure there's that appropriate weight. Um, and the term the term growth is not not exclusive; um, it's conditioned by those clear commitments around sustainability, and it is inclusive growth that we're trying to achieve. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone because that's been the in terms of inclusive growth, the government's mission for some time. I suppose inclusivity has been better defined and better understood over uh, recent years. And for all those reasons, I under understand the, the sensitivity, but hopefully I'm able to express how, in continuing with the growth element, um, we're not undermining the environment because we're very clear it's about sustainable economic growth. The question really is, I mean, if you're wedded to sustainable and inclusive economic growth, I don't want to have an argument about the term, it'd be better as an outcome. I think the outcome is clear. I mean, we've obviously tried... The, the, the outcome is a sustainable economy. Yes. That, that is a, actually a much more general term. And I suppose my point is that that is p arguably more appropriate as an overarching purpose. And if you want to persist with uh, economic growth, that that should be one of the outcomes that helps deliver the purpose. I actually think there's a popular view around our purpose, around economic growth. I think if we were um, to diminish that, as I say, in the terms of uh, sustainability, inclusive and adding well-being, I think strengthens the purpose. Now, you could argue change one or the other or, or, or both, but we're content as a government that that expresses our purpose in, in a meaningful way. And the outcome 
um, uh, is succinct in what we're trying to achieve and is succinct uh, as an outcome uh, as well. We have a globally competitive, entrepreneurial, inclusive and sustainable economy. That's the outcome. Our purpose of government encapsulating it all to focus on creating a more successful country with opportunities for all to flourish through increased well-being and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. I, I think they're in harmony. Now, I know there are some you know, environmental perspectives that would like to say remove the word growth. I think it's a, 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 a consensual view to say that that's included, but we want it to be focused on well-being and equality and sustainability as we achieve that growth. And the government's view on that hasn't shifted since we came into office, but I think our purpose is now proposed to be better uh, defined and uh, refined. Uh, it's true to say... Uh, the outcome itself is slightly more succinct and shorter, but that's the nature of, of actually all the outcomes, to be a bit more succinct and shorter, because the purpose is trying to encapsulate it all. OK. Um, moving on to sustainable development goals. Um, this is uh, uh, agreed by the UN um, and, and all members of the, of the UN. I think I've signed up to it, the UK signed up to it, the Scottish Government signed up to them, and um, you have incorporated them into the National Performance Framework in a, I suggest, a fairly kind of a crude way. You've, you've, you've taken the, the 17 goals and identified which outcomes they fit into. Um, but I'm just wondering, the Sustainable Development Goals, there's 17 of them, there's 169 targets and there's 232 indicators. And these, these indicators are, are really quite specific ones. So if we take goal seven, goal five on achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls, um, you've got things like um, proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments and local governments. You've got proportion of total agricultural population with ownership or secure rights over agricultural land by sex. Um, so there's 232 very specific indicators that are part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm just wondering why none of the targets or none of the indicators have been built into the National Performance Framework. Yeah, they have, they have. <laughs> I'll let Roger cover yeah. this as the Chief Statistician, but actually they have. So. Uh, yeah, and like I, I said before, I think uh, I, we can't have uh, 232 indicators for, for Scotland. That's not manageable uh, in, in terms of giving you a picture of really what's going on here. Well, what we've done, like I said before, in the, the indicator uh, review and consultation, getting to, to the point where we've got this pro proposal of 79 indicators, uh, one of the criteria was alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So what we've done is um, looked at the, the ideas that, that came forward and where there's an opportunity to align with the list that, that you're looking at there, uh, that we've taken that, for example, uh, we uh, had the proposal of uh, what proportion of renewable electricity uh, is, what, what's the what's renewable electricity as a proportion of all electricity uh, generated uh, or all electricity used. And the UN goal was uh, looking at that as a proportion of all energy used. Uh, so what we've done is just changed and, and aligned exactly with the, the UN goal. And that's uh, one example of a, of a number. Given, given that the, the indicators, I mean, you say 232 is, is, is too many. Actually, there are, you publish a lot of statistics. You publish hundreds, thousands of statistics. Um, I can understand the argument that you want to try and focus on 50, 60, you've got 79 here, in a national performance framework to measure how society is progressing. I can understand that. But given that we have very detailed indicators that are agreed and adopted, will the Scottish Government actually be reporting on all of them, whether in the National Performance Framework or outside it? Because yeah. I think the impression is that if you... you, you I mean, I've heard language to the effect that the Sustainable Development Goals have been incorporated into the National Outcome, uh, National Performance Framework. It's not strictly true if, if all the indicators are not being okay. measured. Uh, you know, I just, I, again, to be absolutely clear, the Sustainable Development Goals have absolutely been incorporated and embedded into the National Performance Framework. That's just a matter of fact. They have the, the vision, the goals, is, is driving the kind of society that we want to 
to deliver. I believe that that, that is part of it. The separate question around all of the indicators um, that they have when it comes to Scotland, when it comes to an equivalent performance framework for the outcomes that we have, um, we're actually at the upper end, a very comparable nation of the number of indicators that we're using to judge progress and success towards our outcomes and our purpose. So this is for the focus of the national performance framework. So I would argue that we have taken on board uh, the goals because the First Minister has publicly uh, signed up to them. Clearly, um, we are supportive of them. As to the measurement, this isn't the, the place to measure every uh, UN sustainable goal uh, indicator, but we've signed up to the goals within the NPF. Now, I think there was a fair question about how, how you're able to measure all of that in relation to the UN sustainable goals. But this is not in itself just the measurement of our delivery of the UN sustainable development goals. It's the delivery of the government's purpose in our national performance framework. So I get there's a subtle point in what we're measuring, but here we're measuring the national performance framework in which we have certainly encompassed the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But what we measure here is for the purpose of this. The, okay. the Sustainable Development Goals are incorporated in the National Planning Framework. Okay. They're there. There's 17 of them. They're there. Yeah. The goals don't sit in isolation. They have targets and indicators associated with them. That's in order for the UN to be able to monitor mm -hmm. the extent to which the goals are being realised. Uh, so my question really is, on the 169 targets and 232 indicators, which are intrinsic to the agreement, where will they be reported on? How will we m measure the extent to which Scotland is meeting the Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, so uh, and we're already uh, measuring uh, quite a number of those things, but they're just not necessarily appropriate, as Cabinet Secretary said, for the National Performance Framework itself. For example, on crime, there are a number of crime types that are part of the uh, UN, that, that are indicators of the, in the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals whereas we have an overall measure of, of crime victimization. Uh, but we're still uh, measuring, uh, on measuring and reporting on those things uh, in the, the wide range of statistics that, that we produce across Scotland. Uh, and Within the next two, three years, will we see a publication listing the, the 169 targets and 232 indicators and the measurements of the Scottish Government? Before you answer that, Cabinet Secretary, one other bid for a question, Alexander Stewart, who will take in a second. When you answer that, if there's any additional information you have to give, could, could you write to the committee in relation to this? Because we're going to shortly close this evidence session. I think there's been quite a good exchange in relation to the, the national performance uh, uh, framework and, and the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. But if you could answer that question, Cabinet Secretary, we'll move on after that. Yeah, I think I would answer it in the way that I did earlier. That, And I very much appreciate Andy Whiteman uh, agreeing that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are absolutely part of the MPF. There is then a valid question about where in the one place do we comprehensively report all of their indicators for that purpose. Th that relates to my earlier comment about what the committee might be interested in. Monica Lennon's given an example around a housing indicator. I, I don't know if there are any others. There clearly are here in relation to one place, a go-to place in relation to UN Sustainable Development Goals. If the committee wants to take that view, I will then respond. What, what, what I'm describing today is what we're proposing to measure for the purpose of the National Performance Framework. And if I require to give further thought to where other things are reported and measured, then I'm more than happy to do that, and I'm particularly happy to do it in relation to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But the important point here is that the committee is agreeing that the goals themselves are embedded in the MPF and we're trying to work towards them. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Mr Whiteman, as well. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. The, the purpose, as you've indicated, Camp Second, is to have a refresh and to try and extend and expand uh, uh, this whole process. And I think that has been achieved in what the consultation you've taken forward. Uh, some may say 79 are maybe too many, uh, but time will tell as to how that progresses. But I think what is important is the, the whole idea of communication and the communication plan you've touched on uh, about how we can make sure that that then does become the reality. Uh, and there needs to be the, the, the cross-sector and cross-cutting portfolios that you've touched on, but it's about engaging with the communities. So I, would I, I'd like to have a little bit more expanse on what you're planning to try and do to make that communication plan work and how you're going to manage, as has already been identified, with some communities that are difficult to reach and some sectors within these communities that are difficult to reach. 
Uh, it's a fair question, uh, convener. Uh, as I've expressed earlier, there will be a communications plan, a high-profile event. There'll be communication to um, the organisations, um, part of government, public sector, uh, then the, the third sector, local government. So all partners will receive this. I'm quite reassured that the degree of uh, cross-party a buy-in as well. You know, business organisations are represented as, as much as um, charities, environmental, human rights representatives on the round table. So I'm hoping that that degree of buy-in and collaborative working will then cascade out very positively what ultimately we can sign up to following the parliamentary scrutiny as well. So the degree of buy-in, the degree of communication uh, between a high-profile um, a, a event that, that's envisaged um, and then cascading the purpose and the outcomes and the reasons, and then trying to make it real. What practically should people be doing to deliver this is, is, is really important as well, and that will run right through um, the government's mission going forward. And of course, when, when we come to things like formulating uh, the budget and examining performance, align people uh, to, to, to that monitoring, that evaluation and that mission. So as you say, the, the wonderful opportunity we've got, if we can actually agree on this, and I do sense a lot of agreement, it goes beyond just the party of government and beyond just the government, uh, which makes it about our society as well. And this is the first time we've tried to define our mission and our purpose beyond just what the government wants to achieve and our purpose as a society as well, which takes us into our values. And frankly, um, if I can get a round table to get agreement between people like Murdo Fraser and Patrick Harvey, I suggest I'm not doing too bad in that um, uh, regard. But it's been a, quite an a engaging process. And then when we reach agreement, hopefully it can have that momentum in projecting the, the outcomes and the mission. Thank you. OK, a couple of uh, mopping up questions, Cabinet Secretary. And, uh, if you want to write to us in relation to these, you can as well. I mean, this is not just the Scottish government's responsibility making these the, these uh, the, these outcomes and indicators a reality. It's, it's across the entire public sector. Um, so, so a bit more information, rather than you know, you set the outcomes and you set the indicators, and you you release the public sector to get on in partnership to delivering these. And in five years' time, we see how we've all done. What ongoing monitoring will there be? Uh, every year, every two years, to see how things are going and to correct things if they're necessarily not going the way you would like them to go. Some information on that would be quite helpful. In principle, there will continue to be the monitoring through the Scotland Performs website that will always be uh, updated and improved. It runs through to the local improvement plan. It's a very important point you made earlier about how this affects local areas. It will also continue to look at the equalities issue, so it's a whole population approach, but how we're looking at individual parts of society. And in terms of monitoring evaluation, in addition to Scotland Performs, um, uh, the uh, Scotland Performs uh, report card is also given to parliamentary committees as part of the budget process as well, so that will continue. I'm sure the audit agencies will continue to hold us to account. But you're right, it's not about publishing a document and then leaving it for five years. It will remain under review. Our legislative requirement will be to refresh it every five years, uh, the purpose and the outcomes, or the outcomes, uh, but I can assure committee that we'll also have a mid-term a uh, a refresh or, or look again at the indicators to make sure are they working in the fashion that we would expect. If you require any more than that, convener, I'm happy to supply it to committee. That's helpful, and this committee and others may want to have a role in relation to just doing a little bit of scrutiny around that when, when we get to that point. Uh, finally, I suppose there has, it's one of these things where uh, all the committees kind of knew this was coming down the line from the Community Empowerment Act and this would happen, and then it suddenly happens, and it, it feels like a bit of a rush process, not from the point of view of government, but from the point of view of parliamentary scrutiny, perhaps, it feels a little bit of a rush process, but that is set out in the legislative requirements and those have been met by government. Do you think on reflection there's maybe the opportunity to have a little bit more time in the future for a bit more time for parliamentary scrutiny and our direct engagement as committees with stakeholders? Uh, our Deputy Convener mentioned some of the responses we got from stakeholders. There clearly is a lot of interest out there and had we a little bit more time, we could probably have tapped into a lot more of that. I'm just wondering... Um, the, the Act is what it is, and we're meeting these obligations under the Community Empowerment Act. But on reflection, maybe, do you think the next time we do this, maybe a little bit more time for parliamentary scrutiny? I think, in fairness, Convener, by law, I was only uh, required to renew, refresh, give you the outcomes, and that was it, and the consultation report. I've given you a consultation report, much for the findings. You've had a call for evidence, and I gave you the indicators as well. 
So I think I've gone beyond the legislative requirement, and that, and that was a good, and that was the right thing to do, because actually, if I didn't give you the indicators, you would just have asked, how are you going to measure your outcome? So of course, uh, so to your question, do I think there's room for legislative improvement? I'm open to that. If it's about further collaboration, engagement and scrutiny, I think the national performance framework could well be enhanced by that. But being fair to government, uh, as you have been, we did consult early, comprehensively. We've used a wide a ongoing government consultations to help inform this, the Healthier uh, Scotland consultation, the Fairer Scotland consultation. So that we're not constantly going back to people, but learning from what they've told us once as to what matters to them. Um, and the stakeholder group has been cross-party, cross-sector, very involved. They had early sight of direction of travel, the plan, the strategy, the engagement process. It has been comprehensive, and so it should be. So to boil it down to your question of the 40 days parliamentary scrutiny, if Parliament thinks that it needs more time for that bit of the process, I am open to that. But that doesn't in any way diminish the very extensive consultation that, that we've had. I think this adds to it, and that's why I said at the outset, I welcome this parliamentary um, point uh, of engagement. And those 40 days, of course, I mean, um, Roger's told me it's not actually 40 days, it's more it's than that. If you look, yeah, it's 55, but that's because I've got a statistician to my right um, who's gone through the actual number of days. But uh, I'm open to that, Camino. Or any other suggestion, uh, uh, committee, uh, now your clerks are disagreeing to your left, but, but I, I, I'm, open to, I'm open to further improvements to the parliamentary bit of process. But in fairness to government, I've, I've, done, I've gone beyond what was defined in law. And then the parliamentary bit of process is how parliament wanted to conduct the exercise. And again, I commend this committee for taking the interest that it has. Well, it'll be an ongoing interest, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, uh, thank you for putting on record what the, the legislative requirements were and what the Scottish Government has done. I won't get denied in the debate about Easter recesses and weekends and bank holidays and all those kind of things. That's one for another day in another place, I think. But uh, this committee has got an ongoing interest and we look forward to engaging further with the Scottish Government in relation to this, uh, our report on this matter and, of course, the, the forthcoming parliamentary debate. So thank you to yourself and uh, your team for coming along today. Uh, we now move to agenda item two, which is also national outcomes, but is in private session. Thank you.